Good afternoon and welcome to Birdland Media Works. I'm your host, Danielle Pai, and this is part two of a two-part interview with Dr. Roger Landry. Dr. Roger Landry is the president of Masterpiece Living and the award-winning author of Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging. The topic today is Aging in America, the Last Unchallenged Stereotype. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because you once told a story of how you stuck your foot in your mouth pretty much when talking to Chuck Yeager. Can you tell us that story? Yes, I was in the 30s, and that's the last mistake I made. (laughs) (laughs) Hardly. (laughs) Well, uh, I was privileged to uh, get to meet Chuck Yeager, and he's still a friend today. Uh, When he was in his late 50s, he came to the flight test center at Edwards Air Force Base, where I was the chief flight surgeon, and I got to do a physical exam on him. He was flying for defense contractors. He had retired from the Air Force. And after his physical, uh, he was uh, sitting there and graciously sharing stories with me of his remarkable life and career in aviation. And at one point, he told me, he said, "Um, I'm just saying this the first time today, Doc, but I think on the 50th anniversary of breaking the comeback here, which was still maybe uh, 15 years away for him, Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it again. And uh, here comes the mistake. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Landry, who knew it all, uh, said, but Chuck, you'll be 73 years old then. And he looked at me, and uh, he has this this laser look sometimes that makes you very uncomfortable. And then he (laughs) said, what's your point? (laughs) And and what was my point? And my point was that uh, this is a number, 73 in this case, and I naturally associated decreased function, inability to grow faster than the speed of sound just by nature of the number. Now, certainly some people at seven, some people at 20 can't do that yeah. or have the opportunity to do that. But, you know, I was just assuming. And um, so, you know. Didn't he do it two he, times? Not just he, the one time. He did it two more times, oh, right? 50th, 55th, 60 and 60, 50. Wow. And not too long ago. He's in his mid nineties now. And that kind of attitude, uh, you know, I can do it. I'm competent, living a lifestyle of adventure, uh, physical movement, intellectual curiosity. And he has so many friends, uh, sort of a lot of them have passed. And uh, unfortunately, many died in aircraft accidents, but he still has so many friends and so many people who revere him. He's a He's one of those heroes of the uh, of the current older generation because uh, what he did was uh, quite remarkable. And um, so uh, to uh, I made the mistake, and that was my first lesson, and it stuck. Yeah. I'm telling you. So uh, Chuck has done me a great service, and uh, I, can, I, I I occasionally slip, as most of us do, mm-hmm. and say something not in a malevolent way, but is is frankly a misconception and even ageism. And we all have to be careful about that because we've grown up with it and it's, it's almost, it's internalized. Uh, but that particular day uh, makes me less likely to do that. For those just tuning in, we're speaking with Dr. Roger Landry, the president of Masterpiece Living and the award-winning author of Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging. Ellen Langer, who is a psychologist. I love her study. At at Harvard. Yes, I know. We've discussed this. You always light up. So I (laughs) I have to tell the other people who are listening. Uh, She took some 70-year-old men, and this was in the 70s, actually. And they were in their 70s. And uh, she brought them to a place that she had recreated the world from 20 years earlier. So the 1950s, she got old 50s radios, old 50s TVs. There weren't many. There weren't hardly any TV stations then. No computers, no cell phones. And they had to relinquish everything that was a reminder of the current time. And uh, and she took photos, hearing tests, blood tests. Uh, she took videos of them uh, before they went. And they went into this place And in just a week, in just one week, she saw their behavior remarkably change to be much younger, active, optimistic. You know, the the photos, their families said, my God, what happened? They look so healthy and and happy and well. And even the blood tests and the hearing tests and the vision tests all got better. Isn't that amazing? You know, you just just think you can see better, so you do. 
<laughs> just just truly amazing and she has made a career of this she did this early in her career she has written books and uh, one uh, very important one and most recent is counterclockwise mm-hmm. by ellen langer and uh, and basically her point is that to the extent that we expect something uh, that our brain and will, will attempt to program us to make that real and our bodies will go along with that to make that real now face it you know i if I want to look like an 18 year old, okay, that's, that's a little crazy, but <laughs> to, the ex- to the extent that I, you know, and we all feel much younger than we really are. And to the extent that we, we run with that mm-hmm. and, and we behave that way and we, we want to continue to grow and be curious and connect to others and have purpose and, and move more as we would younger. Well, that happens. And uh, so uh, we're, she's still doing the research on that. We still don't know all the ins and outs of it, but it is a real thing. And we see brains changing because we can scan brains now. So if, if, uh, if someone is, quotes, programming themselves to, uh, to grow and to be uh, not really younger chronologically, but feel that they are younger and act like they are younger, making chronological age irrelevant, in other words, that we see things happening physiologically and in the brain uh, that reflect that that is actually what is happening. And theoretically, that makes sense. You get a cut and your body heals itself. You know, you break a bone, it heals itself. So if you're thinking, okay, I'm, I feel like an 18-year-old, I behave like an 18, you might not go back that many years in time, but your body is going to respond and start to regenerate. So it makes sense from a theoretical standpoint, that you could actually reverse some of these things simply by lifestyle. Well, it does, Danielle. And, and when you, you know, this, this sort of boggles the mind, but basically we replace almost all of our cells oh, every few months or so. And so <laughs> why do we replace them with, you know, say you have a bad knee or a, a bad heart or whatever. Why, do we, why are we replacing them basically with cells that are not functioning well? What's going on there? Mm-hmm. Uh, that that kind of boggles the mind when you think we are indeed replenishing our cells. And so the possibilities, as you just alluded to, you know, could could then we influence those cells to actually uh, be much more youthful type cells? And and again, this isn't an age thing; it's a performance thing. Right. You know, it's uh, you know, it's a, the cells, the muscle cells that are that are stronger. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, o- organ cells that where that organ is functioning much better than it did before. I think we'll be seeing that personally now that we've. Uh, sort of uh, map the human genome and we can track these things and see the result. You know, uh, I don't uh, think we've mentioned this before in our conversations, but there's a whole new field of epigenetics mm-hmm. where, where now that we can map the human genome, we can see someone may have a bad gene and yet, and we, and we follow them. And those who live a lifestyle that we're talking about of being, of moving and learning and socially connected and having meaning and purpose versus the traditional usual aging Mm -hmm. lifestyle and we see that those people the first group are less likely to see that gene express itself namely less likely to see that disease actually happen and if it does happen uh, in epigenetics to be able to turn that receptor off and on Exactly. Uh, so it, it's some pretty pretty remarkable stuff going on so we're not we're not just the victim of our genes so to speak mm-hmm. or of our parents you know so it's uh, it's a whole new brave new world danielle now why do you think though that ageism goes so unchallenged in our culture i mean it seems to be the one prejudice that is still acceptable you know, it, it's it, it is amazing, isn't it, that that we have people who uh, denigrate or in some way uh, talk negatively of a condition that where they're going to be if they are lucky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're all aging. We're all in this boat together, as I've heard you say, and uh, it, it it is amazing. And so perhaps maybe that's some of it. Maybe. Uh, because our society uh, reveres and focuses on youth, we can't bear to think of not being youthful. And uh, therefore, as uh, many people do with dark humor or fears that they have, they they make jokes about it Uh, or say something that essentially says, not me, 
but old people. Sir Francis Bacon says, I consider someone who's old, who's 15 years older than I am. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, and I have to tell you a a funny story. You know, I went out to breakfast a couple weeks ago and there was a lady who was 93 years old and she sat down waiting for her. She's actually waiting for a table. And she kept saying to all of us, don't get old. It's awful. Don't get old. Don't get old. And I felt like she was putting a curse on me because what's the alternative? You're either going to get old or die. So... (laughs) I would actually well, much prefer to get old, but learn how to age in a healthful way. Yeah, I would, I would interpret the word old to mean compromised and declining. That's mm-hmm. what I would say, yeah. because that, it does, it's not a chronological thing. Jaeger told me that, and we're learning that, and the whole idea of chronological age irrelevant means that. So what she's saying is just don't get compromised. Mm-hmm. Don't lose function don't act and make bad decisions that cause you to be what traditionally has been associated with being old but now we know doesn't have to be Mm -hmm. necessarily so uh so what she's saying is true but we have to interpret the word old in a different way than than it sounds a very good point now is there a litmus test to tell if we're being ageist but don't know it I think there is. I think, you know, our our sense of social justice, uh, you know, over the past 50 years is has grown very, very strong. We've had we've had huge social justice movements uh, with race relations, uh, with gender, uh, with uh, the handicapped, just about anything. Mm -hmm. And we have become very conscious. Unfortunately, sometimes we take some steps back. But Mm -hmm. in general, that has been the movement. And and. I think it has been successful because I think people, when the when the when the light is focused, when the spotlight is focused on something that they maybe had taken for granted as the truth, mm-hmm. and they begin to see it in its reality, uh, that makes things different. So, for instance, uh, you know, someone may have great disdain or or talk negatively of a particular race. Mm-hmm. But if, but never have had the opportunity to sit down, no. discuss, be, have communicate with so much happens, magic things happen when we actually get to interact. And so much of it is out of ignorance and much of it is um, you hear people talk negatively of the Civil War and no one is alive today who ever experienced the Civil hmm. War. And that has only happened because of the passing down of negativity, prejudice, hmm. many of those things. So uh, I, I think I think a good litmus test is to say, would you say, would you replace old, the word old, with another statement? I'm too blank to do something. Uh, I don't like you because you're blank. Now, we, uh, we, we would never consider saying things like being African-American or being a woman or. So you'd never a- say, right, you know, like. Oh, you're too Jewish to do that, or oh, you're too Hispanic to do that. People would be mortified. But if you say you're exactly. too old for that, eh, that people don't react. That, you, that is exactly what I was attempting to say, and you said so much better, Danielle. So, <laughs> it so if you put if you substitute old for something that is now something you would never say that had to do with racism or bias or prejudice or negativity or just plain meanness. Yeah. Uh, substitute old in there, and for that would that's a good litmus. Does that make you uncomfortable? It doesn't right now as a society, but I think uh, if you when you focus the spotlight on it, as I mentioned, uh, either by really understanding or being educated about this, experiencing this this other group, or hearing yourself say the words mm-hmm. that would otherwise be abhorrent. Uh, I think this is a good test to start to you thinking that perhaps maybe there's a little bit of an adjustment necessary in your views. Yeah. And you are a huge advocate of changing public policy with respect to older adults. And you have been quoted as saying, our older adult population is the solution to many of the problems our society faces. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Public health is the place where you can make the greatest gains uh, in some of the that we have seen uh, in public health or in public policies, take the smoking instance. Uh, you know, we worked for decades to try to decrease smoking, and all we were seeing was really increased uh, rates of smoking. But when 
we found out that people who weren't smoking were being injured by secondary smoke. Uh, then we began to pass laws and have policy that would protect these people. And with that came a dramatic reduction in smoking. Public policy is a very, very powerful tool. Uh, uh, some people can call it heavy, heavy handed, but that's, this is, this is what public health is about, mm-hmm. that you look at a population and you try to influence the environment so that this population can be healthier. And sometimes that does require that we protect the innocent. We protect those who aren't making a bad choice, but are being injured by those who are making bad choices. This is why we license drivers. This is because they can hurt people. This is why, you know, many people give the uh, the idea we should license anything that, that can hurt people from a public health policy. And so, uh, public health is is a is a very very powerful uh, uh, approach to this this whole aspect of how we view aging and how we can create an environment with public policy that can actually uh, make it more likely that someone will have a better aging experience. In other words, be able to live a lifestyle so that people can walk safely to errands and uh, walk safely across the street, uh, have enough time to cross the street, are not afraid to be going out and walking or biking, having trails, that uh, we have ways for uh, beyond what we have that that uh, challenge an older adult to learn new things or to share their their experience, and so to use their brains and continue to to grow and and learn new things and and to stay in touch with others and not become more isolated, and particularly with other generations, so something that uh, fosters an intergenerational contact, a whole mentoring uh, possibilities. I, I think we should have a national. A registry of people who volunteer to share their skills and experience with those younger and sort of match them up so have a mentoring uh, program and people would then find purpose so that we don't pasteurize our older adults we give them easy opportunities to choose if they want and i hope they do to stay engaged in life and not be on the bleachers but be out on the playing field this the way to make the giant uh, steps here is with public policy and the only way to do that and this is what masterpiece living and so many other groups and you are involved with and that is uh, gaining experience building a a very powerful argument for what i was just talking about and that requires data for 10 15 years uh, just about 15 now masterpiece living has been tracking what happens to older adults in their partner communities when we create cultures that believe that they can grow, that stimulate them to move and learn and be connected and to have purpose and uh, what happens to them. And we see remarkable things happen, lowered reduction in their risks, less emergency room visits, less falls. And, and overall, we're hoping to measure someday with a new partner, and we're talking about that, lowered health care costs, but basically a higher quality of life and more of a life that we, that I wrote about in my book, live long and die mm-hmm. short. So not, not this long drawn out, painful, expensive, you know, degrading type of experience over decades. Rather it's fully functional until you're pretty much fully functional or as close to it until your time comes and falling off a tree rather, you know, rather like these new England leaves, I'm at Cape mm-hmm. Cod as we speak, and in the fall, the leaves are beautiful, and I like to get more colorful as I age and blend with others and make more beauty, and then when my time comes, I just want to fall off. Yeah. So what is the first step we can take to change public policy? Well, like most things, Danielle, I, I think it starts with us. Yes, I believe it was Gandhi who said, be the change you want to see. And, and so what do we change? I think we have addressed so much of it, our view of aging our language, our search to understand what older adulthood is and what benefits there are and what uh, tremendous amount of human capital, a virtual treasure trove of experience and wisdom uh, as ourselves, and I'm hoping eventually as society that we would do these things. To I think it's to be, I think we have to become, looking at social activism again, intolerant of of ageism when we see it 
Now, if someone has said something that wasn't malevolent, we can just sort of nudge them uh, to make them understand that what they just said doesn't really uh, match with reality and uh, or that it can be hurtful. Uh, I think that we should uh, personally in our lives foster intergenerational communication uh, so that the older adults aren't pasteurized and over on the side of the, on the margins of society, but that, that the young and old, uh, that we talk to each other and understand each other because communicating is, is it really is the, the way to get rid of so much of, what, of the ills of the world, including war. And uh, but certainly including prejudice. And um, I think there has to be an activism. Uh, I'm seeing so much uh, activism that is that is aimed at uh, the bottom line, so to speak, mm-hmm. so that if a company does something that is abhorrent, uh, we have seen people fail to purchase their product. Mm. And I think that if we have a company that for one reason or another uh, makes a commercial or something that is disdainful, I think we should let them know. And if, and if they don't respond to that, I, I think, I think we have to vote with our feet personally. I mean, this is a personal choice, but I, I think we've seen remarkable things happen when we do this. I, th- I think we have to be intolerant in a gentle, nurturing, constructive way as much as possible uh, to lead us all as a country uh, into a realization that um, that aging is uh, is an adventure. It's a privilege. It is a place where people uh, can be very happy if they are not under the, the stereotype that aging is only about the climb, or they're not marginalized or invisible in a society, and they're valued by that society. And uh, you know, we know that that's possible. We've seen it, and it's simple. And uh, for each one of us, it's about moving, learning, being connected and having meaning and purpose and doing all we can to foster that in others. The book is Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging. And you can pick up a copy at LiveLongDieShort.com. Dr. Roger Landry, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a pleasure, Danielle, as always. 